I'm hoping just uh, sort of uh, to be able to impart a little bit of my work and uh, experience. We, I did a study some 20 years ago on the effects of acupuncture on sleep. And at that time, I of, co of course, I researched all the literature uh, about uh, sleep problems. And as classically, there are a few patterns described in TCM textbooks. But when you have your patients, either they don't fit the patterns or they are presenting several patterns. And uh, for any of you who have had to uh, tackle this difficult problem of sleep, people who come seeking uh, <coughs> treatments are usually not those who have had a sleep disturbance since a few weeks. It's usually people who have had 20 years of sleep disturbance. And of course, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's like headaches. It's not one pattern, it's several patterns. Often several problems are intricated. That's why it makes the treatment much more complex. And uh, another point is that in the work I've done, of course, there's a lot of uh, referencing to classical texts and classical uh, information we have. But also, there is a lot of uh, things that we know, but it's not written down. And it would be pity to miss these points. I always mention that uh, the Chinese medicine that has come down to us today has three origins. Of course, the classics, all the classical texts that have survived, actually, because there are texts that have disappeared. Then there is the oral tradition. And the oral tradition especially was kept alive in China in the Taoist tradition, as they had uh, healers. And it was transmitted by, uh, from master to disciple. And of course, the third tradition is the other countries which have been practicing Chinese medicine. Amongst them, for example, Vietnam, Japan, and of course in Europe, France, who was the first country who was actually exposed to Chinese medicine, interested in Chinese medicine. And now we can say we have almost 100 years of uh, French acupuncture experience. Now, to disregard these traditions under the pretext that they were not written in the old classical text would be missing a lot of interesting concepts and approaches. And that's my uh, sort of emphasis in the work I've done here. And also, I'll be presenting tomorrow another uh, presentation on management of pain, again based very much on the French European school. Now, this is a uh, result of a mixture of these things, plus my own uh, concoctions, <laughs> if I may call them so, uh, and sort of extrapolations. Now, first of all, when we talk about sleep uh, in Chinese medicine, uh, I'm before anything a, uh, a physician and a Western, uh, although I come from the Middle East originally, but I'm more tending to a Western logical experimental thinking. So when I studied Chinese medicine, I did not take anything for granted. When uh, <coughs> the <coughs> concepts were given, for me, these concepts had to clinically show results. And uh, I was very lucky that I, I, at that time, I was a resident in the hospital, and I could practice immediately what I learned and test it, put it to the test. And a lot of Chinese concepts are not on face value what they should be. For example, the simple fact of mu points. Uh, mu points, alarm points, are not what we say they are when they are painful. We say the organ is affected, the organ is sick, but which organ are we talking about? Now, the topic is not that. I, what I'm trying to say is that do, please do not buy anything or take anything for granted. Whatever we give you, experiment. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't work, throw it away. So there is no. Now, what is sleep? <coughs> in the West, re in the recent years, a lot of emphasis has been put on sleep to understand sleep. Why is that? It's because it's one of the human activities, not only human, but also all animals, is that it, it's necessary to life. We always say we need air, water, and food to survive. And in Chinese medicine, we know that the first 
unit, what we call first unit in the circulation of qi, starts with lung channel, followed large intestine, stomach and spleen. We call that the first unit. And the first unit is all about survival, air and water and food. But it follows immediately after with the heart channel. And what is the heart channel doing in that sequence? It's basically the residence of Shen. And we'll see that one of the functions of Shen, one of the primary functions of Shen, is consciousness. And of course, when the Shen is suspended, sleep. So we see that sleep is as vital to life as air, water, and food. Of course, you stop breathing after two minutes, you asphyxiate, you stop eating, you can survive longer. Without water, you survive maybe 10 days. But without sleep, they have done tests to see how long people can survive without sleep. And every time on voluntary base, they had to suspend the experiments after several weeks because people would start behaving strangely. <coughs> there would be no uh, physiological changes, but the mind would start misbehaving and uh, the people start losing their minds. They start hallucinating, they start uh, having uh, psychotic uh, behaviors. So sleep is known to be essential to life, and yet today we don't know why we sleep. This is what is fabulous. Now, it is said that it is a naturally recurring condition of rest for the body and the mind. And uh, they have seen that all animals, mammals and even reptiles and fish, they sleep. Anybody who's done diving here at night, uh, you will observe fish sleeping at the bottom of the sea. They make a little bubble and they sleep in it. It's fabulous. So sleep is essential to life. And some facts. We sleep one third of our lives. Now sometimes we forget how important that is. Uh, if we live, uh, let's say, good lifespan of 80, 90 years, 30 years is spent sleeping. And from that, about a quarter is spent dreaming. Now, obviously, these are uh, the sleep time changes from the infant. Uh, the sleep time is about 20 hours, and it slowly reduces to stabilize itself around six to seven hours in an adult person. Now, why do we sleep? That's still a question neuroscientists are asking. <coughs> we have done a lot of progress. A lot has been discovered, but still we don't know why exactly we need this, what we call sleep. Now, what, as I mentioned before, sleep deprivation does not cause any physiological uh, disbalances in the body, except it provoked, after a certain time, psychotic episodes. And when there has been a sleep deprivation, there is a compensation that takes place. That means that the person who is going to sleep not so many hours, but they are going to increase two phases of the sleep, deep sleep and paradoxical sleep, which is dreaming stage. That means that when you ha we have had lack of sleep and when we can catch up, we don't catch up in total of sleep, but what is absolutely necessary. And we are going to uh, explore this a bit further. It seems that the deep stage sleep, which I'll describe it in a moment, is more for physical repair. So the body goes into a total atonia where all the muscles are relaxed and the brain has very, very slow activity. And here the body repairs <coughs> itself. Whereas the dreaming phase, is mainly for the brain to release its accumulated toxins. Now, first of all, the sleep-wake cycle is the most important cycle in the human being. And uh, what is very interesting, if you remember the original Chinese, for them, the rhythm of life was this alternating rhythm of day and night. It's represented in the ancient uh, representation of yin and yang, where you have the yang, the sunny side of the hill, and yin, the shaded side of the hill, which shows 
the alternance of yin and yang, day and night. Scientists have wondered if our uh, circadian cycles coincided with the day and night cycle of the Earth. You know, the Earth rotates <coughs> and it has a cycle of 24 hours and some minutes. And uh, so they did the experiments by putting people in um, uh, sort of isolation away from daylight. All clocks were removed and people were left to find their own internal rhythms to sleep and wake at their own will without having any rhythm imposed by society or by day and li uh, uh, daylight and nighttime. What is very interesting, they were expecting to find a rhythm close to 24 hours. No, they found a rhythm close to 25 hours. They still are debating the reason for this strange internal clock. Some scientists have said, but this corresponds to the rotation of planet Mars. I'll let you <laughs> pull, pull your own conclusions. Uh, is man coming from planet Mars? And in that case, are women coming from Venus? That's <laughs> now. Keep this rhythm of 25, I will come back to it. It's very interesting. The Chinese had noticed it. Now that is fabulous. We have within this rhythm of uh, the circadian rhythm, we have what is called an ultradian rhythm, which is uh, about 12 hours, which explains that in most civilized countries, people have a nap after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this I found on the internet. It's the biolog biological clock, not at all Chinese. This is a, uh, by, done by Western uh, scientists on a uh, sort of an adult, a young adult of, uh, in a healthy condition. And you will notice what is very interesting, a very curious uh, correlation with the Chinese, famous Chinese midday midnight clock. Now, what is important for sleep obviously, is the melatonin release in the brain, which enhances sleep, and then the melatonin that stops in the early morning, which is going to uh, enhance waking. Plus, the body temperature is very important because there is a correlation between deep sleep and lowered body temperature. We know that when we sleep, uh, we usually need a blanket. Now, this again, keep in mind because I will make a parallel with the Chinese system. Other things, some of them are interesting. For example, the most likely time for bowel movement, which corresponds uh, in the Chinese system, uh, basically we say five to seven is the time ideally. And we see that also observed. Some other things are strange. For example, nine o'clock is the highest time of testosterone release. Usually that is not the most ideal time <laughs> <laughs> to follow. And uh, what is very interesting, we see the fastest reaction time corresponds to the bladder channel or bladder organ time. And we know the bladder connection with the back shoe and the dermatomas and all the uh, sort of um, nerves that communicate with the spinal cord and the periphery. Uh, greatest <coughs> cardiovascular efficiency that is strange, but anyway, that's what they have discovered. And so we see that some of the um, uh, sort of clocks, as we have discovered them, I, mean, I remind you, this is an average adult, uh, correspond to the Chinese system. Now, in, in, the, in the situation of sleep, we need to know about how we uh, structure the sleep and how we analyze sleep. Sleep is analyzed uh, today in laboratories which are called sleep laboratories. And uh, there is a combination of electroencephalogram, cardiogram, and uh, also spherogram to analyze uh, breath, breathing, because we know <coughs> there is more and more problems of sleep apnea, so to, to see how people breathe. Uh, also uh, to monitor the blood pressure, the heart pulse, of course. And also in men, uh, they sometimes use the a penal, um, uh, ring to measure the turgescence in the penis. Interestingly, during 
dreaming phase, there is a blood flow to the external genitalia, which Western medicine absolutely has no explanation for. And of course, they use this method to diagnose between um, primary and secondary uh, impotence in men or erectile problems in men, because even men who uh, have problems, erectile problems, uh, they might have a normal blood flow during dreaming, which eliminates the primary causes. Anyway, in the stages of sleep, this has been changed. Uh, originally, they were classifying into four <coughs> stages. Today, the new classification is N1, N2, and N3. What interests us most is the N3 stage, which basically it's defined by an activity of the brain, which is very slow and called the delta wave or delta activity. And usually when we get reports from sleep laboratories, the delta <coughs> activity is measured as a, a reflection of the quality of sleep. And uh, so they call that delta sleep. For us, in practical terms, that corresponds to deep sleep. The other phases, N1 and N2, are what fill up the night, but they are not important phases. And uh, the difference between people who sleep short and those who sleep long is basically the long sleepers have longer N1 and N2. And the uh, shorter sleepers, basically, they have a um, more, uh, uh, more N3 and a more paradoxical sleep in a shorter time. They, there are some people like uh, um, Leonardo da Vinci was uh, famed to sleep 20 minutes every, every six hours, I think. So it doesn't make much sleep. But what he did was obviously he managed in that short time to go very deep in sleep. This, of course, with practice also can improve. If you've done yoga and so on, you can improve that quality, that part. Now, paradoxical sleep or REM sleep, for those who are familiar with this term, it's rapid eye movement, is a phase where eyes are moving, the body is paralyzed, apparently, and the person has a very intense uh, brain activity as though he was awake and living the situation. So this is the dreaming phase. And dreaming has been demonstrated to have the same importance for health as sleeping does. They have done experiments by uh, distinguishing when a person was starting to dream and giving an impulse to wake the person up very superficially so they don't really wake up, they just come out of the dream and continue sleeping. They sleep nine, 10 hours a night and after three, four weeks they start having the same psychological disturbances as observed <coughs> in people who don't sleep. So we know that we need to dream. There are many dream theories uh, which uh, uh, I have sort of explored a bit in the book None of them are, every person, I mean, there might be about 15 different dream theories, and none of them are really satisfactorily explaining all the as aspects of dreaming. Now, what happens during dreaming, and that, again, I borrowed from the internet, is that parts of the brain, which are in white, are disconnected, so they are not active. That's why the person does not have movements usually most of them are the motor cortex, the sensory cortex, the person does not perceive sounds or smells in the same way as when you're awake. Of course, if the sound is very loud, the person may wake up. But what is very interesting is that there are parts of the brain, the visual cortex, and the, especially the limbic area, and the cerebellum are active, which means that the person seems to see things. That's what dreams are. We see images. The limbic area and the amygdala are the emotional responses to what we see. As though we see scenery, we respond to them emotionally. And of course, we know that the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, all that are controlling basically the uh, autonomous uh, system, the heartbeat, the breathing, etc. So. Actually, we live 
a, an emotional experience during our dreams as though we were experimenting or witnessing the situation. Now, this is a, f a very interesting uh, discovery. It's very recent. It's only with imagery that they have been able to uh, sort of visualize that. But this comes back to also a lot of other um, dream concepts that we have in Chinese medicine. Now, what is interesting also is that dreams, uh, sorry, uh, sleep has cycles, which we call sleep cycles. And they are usually, we say, between 60 and 90 minutes long. And they are defined by the occurrence of a dreaming phase, usually at the end of the cycle. So that means that every time we go through N1, N2, deep sleep, we come out of deep sleep into paradoxical sleep, dreaming phase. And then usually <coughs> at the end of the dreaming phase, there is a moment of waking. Depending on the length of this waking time, we will remember or not the dream. Some people, uh, when we do in sleep laboratory, all of that is registered by graphs. So we can very clearly see that here the person was having a dreaming phase, and here they woke up for a few seconds and went back to sleep. So here the dream will be forgotten. Uh, as the night goes on, the dream phase gets longer. And that's why we often remember the last dreams that we have had. With training, of course, people manage to remember more and more dreams. Dreams could occupy between 15 to 20 minutes of each cycle. And you can do your maths in a night time. They could take from 20 to 25% of the sleep time could be taken in dreaming. Now, this is very important because uh, we are today, yesterday was very interesting. I was listening to Dr. Cummings talking about the, uh, the politics of assessment of methods. And I realized uh, I did a study, and uh, it was my first and my last study I'll ever do. Because what is very interesting is that all studies today that come out are biased. Who is paying for that study? What is the aim of the outcome? Now, nobody has interest to prove that acupuncture works for sleep. Why is that? You just have to look. Yesterday he was talking about one laboratory. You just have to look what in France, year after year, is the highest selling, single highest selling drug in France. It's sort of the hit parade of medicines. It's diazepam, Valium. The French are popping it. Now, I mean, okay, we say the French are stressed and we are fine here and whatever. But I think uh, one country represents the others. And we are talking about industrialized countries. And uh, people are more stressed. They have more sleep problems. And they are popping Valium like this. It helps them relax at night and go to sleep. A lot are using it for 25, 30 years. When they come to see us with sleep problems, what challenge are they giving us? I'm under sleeping pills for 20 years. Can you get me off them? Sure, yeah, I have a recipe here. I'm going to do a few points. Heart seven, every book is saying heart seven, <laughs> six. Stop your pills. And they stop it, and they spend the whole night eyes wide open. So that's not a solution. Nobody's interested. Who's interested to, to stop the population taking pills and have acupuncture? So we have to be very logical about these things. We are up against much more powerful uh, politics and finances. In Chinese medicine, I couldn't resist the photos of animals sleeping. I have dozens and dozens of them. There were not enough chapters in this presentation to show them all. Now, in Chinese medicine, obviously, this is the basic balance between yin and yang, daytime activities. Yang considered to nighttime activity and sleep, which is yin. But of course, the state of health is a balance between yin and yang. And we see that this is an ideal image. 
balance of yin and yang is not something static, it's in time. It's dynamic because we are more yang during the day and more yin at night. There are the well-known balance of yin and yang and the four phases, and of course we see that sleep, deep sleep, corresponds to the phase of maximum of yin in which also yang is born. Remember the famous Tai Chi yin-yang balance um, where we have the maximum of yin, we always have the beginning of yang. Now this is very important to understand that if we do not reach a maximum of yin, we cannot give birth to a good quality yang. So it's very simple. You don't sleep, you're tired the next day. Uh, you know, it's a sort of common sense, but why? The why is because the yang is not capable of regenerating during the time where the yin reaches its maximum. Now, the normal sleep time is adapted basically to activity. So this would be more a uh, condition in an adult where uh, about, let's say, one third of the time we sleep and two thirds we are active. Now, one thing very interesting also that uh, um, science has noticed is that usually the sleep time is not only adapted to the activity of the past day, but also it could adapt to upcoming challenges. For example, they have noticed sportive people who are going to do a big uh, marathon race the next day, so they will be needing a lot of energy. When they are in a healthy state, they sleep deeper the night before. So in a sense, what they are doing is they are accumulating reserves for the next day. Of course, I said when we are well trained, because most of us, when we have some exciting event happening the next day, we have a terrible night. We don't sleep well. So the next day we are not uh, as performant as other ones. Now, what is important in our work is to evaluate this cycle in our patients. The depth of sleep def is defining how well we sleep. And this is a problem in patients when we ask them, how well do you sleep? Uh, how many hours do you sleep? How many hours is, of course, the duration of the sleep? How many hours does not reflect on the quality alone? How deep did you sleep? And, of course, this is very important because when we analyze <coughs> sleep, we say, are you sleep eight hours? Are you tired when you wake up? If a person says, yes, I'm still feeling I didn't sleep enough, this tells me the quality of sleep was disturbed. Of course, if the length is disturbed, it's simple. People say, I go to bed and I have to spend two hours waiting for sleep to come. Or I go to bed, I sleep at four in the morning, I'm up and I cannot sleep anymore. We'll see that each of these has a diagnostic value. Or I wake up in the middle of the night and I stay awake two hours. So here we see the length of sleep is shortened. But when the quality is poor, people will say things like, I sleep eight hours, but I don't sleep well. Maybe they are having sleep apnea. We know that, for example, the, uh, they have discovered that people stop breathing. So they are constantly in a state of stress. And they sleep eight hours, but they are exhausted when they wake up. They don't breathe. Or they snore. Snoring is like sleep apnea. It disturbs the sleep. Imagine having a sort of ongoing truck <coughs> engine next to your head all night, even if you manage to sleep, it's not great quality. Or they have a lot of dreams, what we call dream disturbed sleep. The dreaming time is taking over the night, which means deep sleep is disturbed. Or they can have uh, physical symptoms, somatic symptoms, for example, restless leg syndrome, or muscle cramps, or after menopause, classically, hot flashes. Or they can have other somatic symptoms. We'll have a look at that. So all of these things which can come and disturb sleep. And it's very interesting, 
uh, where, for example, we have in, uh, even skin diseases could be a cause of insomnia. Pruritus, itching. Mm -hmm. You itch at night, uh, even if you don't wake up, it disturbs the shen. So it, it, sends, it wakes you up. Now, one thing which I have brought in, which is not classically found in textbooks, in textbooks they give you TCM patterns. Now I have to step back a little bit. I remind you that ch classical Chinese medicine at its very origins was basically uh, diagnosing and treating with the concept of yin and yang. So they spoke about yang excess, yin excess, yang deficiency, yin deficiency, and balanced state of yin and yang. This we are talking a few thousand years back. Then slowly came in the concept of channels. So the channel system concepts followed the yin-yang. And then they were really working with the concept of channels. After that came in the concept of the substances. So we are talking about qi, blood, fluids, shen, and jing. And only after that, much later, once the five-phase theory was integrated into Chinese <coughs> medicine, did they start talking about the Zhang Fu as the ministers of the state? And today TCM is starting with the Zhang Fu. So what I can tell you is that we have many approaches to the same problem. It doesn't mean that sleep should only be analyzed with the Zhang Fu or with the substances or with the channels or whatever. So what I've tried to do is to give you all these different approaches